So we look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. This is in the New Living Translation. And we read, shall we read it again together? Let's read together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Wonderful. Let's just leave this up just a little bit. So here we have this exhortation and an encouragement. And there's something that we are called to do. We are called to run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now I want to say something to you this morning. Please do not think of the race that God has set before you as purely a very spiritual thing that has only to do with heaven, that has only to do with telling people about Jesus, that has only to do with testifying and witnessing and doing the work of God in this world. The race that He has set before us, brothers and sisters, includes that, but it also includes our lives, the lives that we live. If you are a husband, it includes the relationship that you have with your wife day by day by day. That's part of the race that you run with endurance in this world. Wives, it, with your husbands, it's the relationship that you have with him. The jobs that you and I have with your employers or if you're self-employed, it includes that as well. You run with endurance, the race. All of that is included in the race that God has set before you. The spiritual parts and the non-spiritual parts as well. It's all part of the race that God has laid out before you. And we are to run it with endurance. In other words, God says we are to, or the writer to Hebrews says, inspired of the Holy Spirit, we are to not give up in this race. You and I meet people all the time that have given up, haven't they? They've given up. This won't work, and they leave the relationship, they break the relationship, and they go on to something else. This job won't work. Now, there are times of changes in our lives, and some things there are that we have to move on from, but we live in a world where most people, when they encounter hardship or difficulty in any level, they just go in another direction. Forget it. But God has called His children to run with endurance. That means we keep on going through it. Don't give up. Don't go away. Don't say forget it and throw something away. We keep on going. We are to run with endurance the race that the Lord has given us to run. And before you say it's just too hard, I can't do it, you don't know what I'm facing, what I want to say to you this morning is this, but God knows what you're facing. And God says to you in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 this morning, run with endurance. And then he gives us the key. He says, as, and this is the New Living. It says, we do this, this is verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. The, new, the NIV says, we fix our eyes on Jesus. Okay, so that's the, that's the picture that we have here. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. So, at the basic level, we talk, some of this is still review, we look to, it means simply we trust in Jesus. We trust in Jesus with our lives. And it means not just a one-time act, but it means an attitude, an attitude. Have you ever met Christians, or have you yourself ever gone through this? You've made one decision to follow God, and then you think, boy, this is awfully hard. I, I feel like giving up. Have you ever felt like giving up? I have as well. The Christian life is not a single act of obedience and not a single step of faith, brothers and sisters. It begins with a step of faith, but it continues with ongoing steps of faith and steps of obedience as God leads us and God calls us. So if you've taken one step, praise the Lord. Good for you, but don't stop. You keep on going and you take the next step. And Jesus says, God the Holy Spirit says, you do this by keeping your eyes on Jesus, looking to Jesus. The NIV here, instead of keeping our eyes on Jesus, the NIV says we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher. And if you remember, we talked about this as well. To fix our eyes carries the meaning with it that we look away from things that distract, okay? 
Look away from those things that distract and instead look to something else and we look to Jesus and that's the picture that we have. We're not alone in this walk. We're not alone in this race and the Bible gives us great examples of people that are examples for you and for me. And if this morning you feel it is so tough, Pastor Jen, you don't, you don't know what I'm going through. I feel like giving up. I have faced such hardship. I faced such difficulty. Then Hebrews chapter 11 is especially for you. You say, but you're not talking about Hebrews chapter 11. No, I'm not. But it's in the Bible just before Hebrews 12. And this begins, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Do you know who that huge crowd is? You go back and you read Hebrews 11, which we will not do this morning because we're going to go in a different direction. We're going to go to the Old Testament. But you go back and you read Hebrews 11 and you're going to read about Abraham who didn't know where he was going and God says, follow me and I'm going to show you a place. And he did. And you're going to read about Moses who gave up the, the riches of Egypt and he pr most likely would have been Pharaoh next. And he gave it up to cast his lot and to be known as, to be identified not with Egypt and its riches, but with God and his people. People like that. And so those are the witnesses, not that are looking at us as we run. Nope, that's not what it means. What it means is, turn it around, we look at them. So if you have been discouraged in running the race with endurance, go back to Hebrews 11 and read about these other people and what they went through and then Hebrews 12 verse 2 we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus and we're not alone in this struggle so this morning I want us as I said I want us to turn our eyes to the Old Testament do you have your Bibles electronic or otherwise it's going to be up here but I encourage you to turn to your Bibles Psalm 73 and we're going to look at Psalm 73. Do you mean Psalm 73 has something to tell us from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Yes, it does. And we're going to see in Psalm 73 a very practical application of what we read, um, of what we read in Hebrews 12, 2. And at any time, are you all warm? I'm a little bit warm. At any time we can turn on the air, I would be so happy. <laughs> you know, preaching is hard work. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to look at this, and I'm going to break it up. You can, if you've got it in front of you, keep the whole thing. We're not going to take a long, long time this morning. But I want you to walk with me through Psalm 73 this morning as we look at this. This is, the, this is a, an Old Testament writer in Psalm 73, and I want us to think of this as an Old Testament example of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Okay, so here's a person, and let's go through it together. Take a minute just to look at it. Let me get out my scriptures as well. And this, and this psalm begins very, very well. It says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. So that's how it starts out. That's a great beginning, isn't it? God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But it descends very, very quickly. This psalm, if you will read all of it, is prompted by this writer who looks at the people around him who are not following God. How many of you look at your own lives and then you look at people around you who are not following God at all. In fact, sometimes they are bad people. Maybe in your work, or you, you may even work for them. They are corrupt. They cheat at times. They don't do business properly. They have terrible attitudes. They do their own thing, and yet they seem to be very successful. Yes or no? Yes? Does it, how does it make you feel? Does it drive you crazy? Do you say, God, this is not fair? And you look at them and your heart gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And you think, but God, I am your child. Why is this happening to me? 
this is the situation of this psalm, okay? But I want us to look at it in the light of Hebrews 12, 2, and we'll look at the principle because the principle here in Psalm 73 is the same thing we read in Hebrews 12, verse 2. So it starts off very well. God is good, but it goes downhill fast. Now let's look at what comes next. He says, but as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. Now look with me at what comes next. Very important. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. Now think about this with me just a minute. And here's the idea. I lost my footing. It's the idea of a walk or a race again. And he looks around him at other people and he said, I've almost lost my footing. He's not running the race with endurance. He's not going to make it at this point. And it says, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. Verse 3, where is he looking? For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper. His eyes are off God. Yes? They are on the wicked around him that are prospering. And verse 3 gives us the reason why. Where's his gaze? He's looking around him. And it truly seems unfair. The seeming prosperity of bad people. And it affects his direction, his progress, his endurance. Now, look with me at verses 4 through 9. As we look at verses 4 through 9, go ahead and read it. I want to ask you something. When you go through difficulties or problems, how many of you find it hard to get your eyes on Jesus? Instead, you're looking at the problem, right? And it's all you can think about, especially if you're working with somebody that it just seems unfair and unjust, or maybe a family member that has cheated you or been unkind to you, and you think, they're doing okay, but look at my, look at my life. I'm having so much trouble. And it fills our hearts, and it fills our minds, and here's a great picture of it, that this, this writer, whoever it is, all he can think about, all he's looking at, all that is occupying his mind is what is around him. It's not God at all. Let's look at it together. He says, they seem to live, live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have problems like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats. That's in the Bible? <laughs> fat cats. Yeah, it's a modern translation, but it's an accurate translation. It's a fat cat. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, that's ten references to them so far, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. In a few short verses, there are 13 references to those people out there. I want to tell you something this morning. The devil, your enemy, will want you to, will work and do all he can to get your eyes off of God, off of Jesus, and onto people around you and onto problems around you. And if he can do that, he will get your feet slipping you will not be able to run the race with endurance. And we see this here, and it encourages me to know that I'm not alone in this struggle. Here is a writer in the Bible who says, look at this, my feet almost slipped. They, theirs, fat cats, this and that, 13 times. It has filled his mind. It has filled his mind, just as it fills our minds as well. And then it goes a little bit further. Look at verse 12. Look at what happens next. Uh, sorry, verse 10 and 11. I'm sorry. Verses 10, verses, we didn't include verses 10 and 11, did we? Hang on just a second. Give me verses 10 and 11. Let me, down at the bottom. Okay, here we go. What happens when people get their eyes off of God? And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Now I want you to see something. Did you notice that a bell has been ringing for the last six or seven minutes? D did you notice how disciplined I was? I didn't say anything until just then. It was driving me crazy. <laughs> Back to the Word of God. What happens 
when this fills our minds. When this fills our minds, this is the result. And the response of our hearts is, doesn't God know anything? Does, does He know anything? Does the Most High even know what's happening? And, and truly, honestly, seriously, brothers and sisters, when our minds are filled with these things, the result will be, God, where are you? Don't you even care? Don't you know what I'm going through? Have you ever felt that before? I have. All I can see is the trouble in front of me. And when I do that, God, don't you even care? It's a little bit like the disciples. Master, don't you care that we're drowning? Because our eyes have gotten off God and onto the troubles and the, the hardships of this world. And I want to tell you something this morning, in all honesty and all seriousness. If that is filling your mind, and if that's where your gaze is this morning, the devil has you looking at exactly what he wants you to be looking at. And he has filled your mind with exactly what he wants your mind to be full of, rather than God. Look at verse 12. And what we see in verse 12, this is what the writer says. Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Do you see the pattern? Here's this writer. They this, they this. And not only is he himself looking at it, and that, then he says to others, look at these people. Exactly the wrong thing. What he should be saying is, oh God. Instead he's saying, look at these people. Not only is he thinking about it, he's telling others, look, look at them. They're this and they're that. And his mind is full of that. And that, we will never make it. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something right now. We live in a world of injustice and unfairness and difficulties and problems. And yet, it is in this very world that God says to you and to me, run this race with endurance. Run this race with endurance. Is it hard? It's hard. But we do this by fixing our eyes. We do this by looking at Jesus. By keeping our eyes on Jesus. Now, skip ahead with me and let's look at what comes next. Verse 16. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. I want you to see something here with me this morning. I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but it's so hard. Let me tell you something this morning. If you do not have God and His mindset and His outlook and His framework as your outlook, and your framework, the world will not make sense to you. Let me say it one more time. If you try to understand the world and problems and difficulties by your own thinking and by your own understanding, it will never make sense. It will wear you down. You will be overcome by the un injustice and the unfairness and the difficulties and the problems of this world. You will not make it. You and I will not be able to run the race with endurance if we try to figure it out in our own understanding. Because if we do, Maybe somebody else, you've been at work, you have been honest, you have worked hard, you have done all you could do, and somebody else gets promoted. And they've been dishonest, and they've cheated. And you know what I'm saying, don't you? That's right. And if you get your eyes on that, and you try to understand it in your own thinking, your heart will be overcome. Because in the framework of the world, it doesn't make sense. The good person should prosper. The honest person should, should get ahead. The person who does what is right should be at the top. But that's not often what happens in this world. And when we try to figure it out on our own, it will wear us down. I tried to understand, but what a difficult task it is. We cannot make sense of the world with our own understanding and with our own framework. Verse 17, stay with me. Then, then, are you with me? I went into your sanctuary, O oh God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. The writer goes into the sanctuary and then he understood the destiny of the wicked. Here is the turning point of this psalm. Now Hebrews 12 2 said, we run the race with endurance by keeping our eyes on Jesus. 
And here's the Old Testament example of what we read in Hebrews 12, 2. The writer goes into the sanctuary of God, and I finally understood. And I, I love this picture that we have here. Because as he comes into God's sanctuary, as he comes into the presence of God, he sees God. And he sees God's ways. And he understands his life from God's perspective. And brothers and sisters, when you and I can come into the sanctuary of God. And you can, you can say this morning, well, Pastor Jen, do you mean like I've come to church this morning? I think it means so much more than that. Because for you and me, as New Testament believers, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and we come into the presence of God. We come into the sanctuary of God, into the holy place. And the word sanctuary, it's such a special word. It has such a, a broad meaning. But it has two very strong meanings, and one of them, Sanctuary means the holy, a holy place. And when we come into God's presence, we're in a holy place. But it has more than that, that meaning, doesn't it? We can find sanctuary. And that means a place of safety and a place of security. And when we come into the presence of God, it is a holy place and it's a place of safety and security. And when the writer comes into the presence of God, he could look away from all the wrong and all the injustice and all the unfairness that filled his mind and then he could begin to understand from God's perspective. And brothers and sisters, this morning I invite you, I invite you, if you are struggling with this, to come into the sanctuary of God. Come into His sanctuary. Come before Him and let Him change your mind and your way of thinking. The problems will still be the same. Situations and circumstances may not have changed on the outside, but you know what will change? Your heart and your mind will change and you will be at rest and you will be at peace in the sanctuary of God. Coming before God and looking at Him will give you and me the perspectives that we need in this world. It will give us the balance that we need. Now, look ahead with me to verse 21 and 22. I'm not looking at everything, but I encourage you on your own to go ahead and look at other parts of this. And I want you to see something. In verses 21 and 22, we see something else. He comes into the sanctuary of God, and first of all, he understands the problems out there. But not only that, what happens now? Then I realized that my heart was bitter, and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Now, listen with me and don't get offended. Very often, we look around us and we say, look at that, look at that, look at that, that problem, and that's wrong, and that's not right, and that's unfair, and all the problems are out there. But when we come, into the presence of God and we begin to look to Him, do you know what God the Holy Spirit will do for us? He will help us to see ourselves also, won't He? How many of you have ever been in a situation and your finger was pointed that way, that way, that way, that way until you came into God's presence and you began to see, oh, my heart has a problem too. Yeah? For sure. For sure. And a lot of times as Christians, we justify it because we say, but they are more wrong than I am. <laughs> have, you ever done, have you ever justified it that way? Well, I may be wrong, but they're wronger. That's not a word. That's not a word. <laughs> Teachers, that's not a word. But you know what I mean, right? I'm wrong, but they're wronger. I'm mad, but they're madder. I'm bitter, but they're more bitter. That's not how God deals with us. Because God deals with us as His children. 
And coming into the presence of God helps us to see ourselves. And we say, oh, Lord, see, forget about the sinners out there. Forget about those, those bad, pe bad people out there. Forget about that. God's, God's concerned with our hearts. God's concerned with us. And when we come into his presence, then we begin to see, oh, Lord, the problem's not just out there. The problem is here as well. Have you found that to be true? Yes. I have. I have found that to be true. And we, we begin to see ourselves and say, oh, God, I didn't see that before. And the Lord, in his love and in his mercy, says, yes, I know, but I wanted you to see that because I want to work on it. Now, keep this in mind, verses 21, 22, and now I want you, he says, I realized my heart was bitter. Now, go back to verse 13. He says, I realized my heart was bitter. Stay in the same psalm. Go back to verse 13, and I want you to see something. Okay, uh, we'll give Andreas just a second because I'm, I'm, I'm giving him a, I'm throwing him a loop. Ah, look, back up in verse 13, he was very self-righteous, wasn't he? What did he say in verse 13? Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? This is while he's complaining about all those bad people, right? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? And when we don't have God's perspective, we can justify anything in our lives and we can feel that I am so right, I am so good, I am so perfect, I, the fault is not mine, until we come into the presence of the Lord. And then we go back to verse 21 and 22 again, and he says, then I realized my heart was bitter. His heart wasn't pure at all. His heart was bitter. It was full of anger. It was full of these things. Now, how many of you have found yourself in exactly that place? Raise your hand and wave it around so that we all feel we're all in this together. How many of you, when you realized that, felt so terrible about yourself? And the load of guilt whoosh, came down on you and weighed you down. Same thing for me. But I want you to see the hope that we have as God's children when we realize the state of our own hearts at times. Do not stop with verse 21 and 22. Go ahead to verses 23 and 24. And this is what I want you to see. Yet, yet, be encouraged brothers and sisters, still I belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. And I want you to be encouraged this morning. When you see your own heart and you say, Oh God, I thought all the problem was out there. But as I have seen you, I have seen myself. Do not let the devil, your enemy, heap guilt and condemnation upon you. For you are yet God's child. Even with the bitterness of heart, even with the stress and the fear and the blame and all of those things, God's hand is upon you and God will lead you and guide you. Now, don't keep a bitter heart. Let him get rid of that. Let him take care of it. Confess it to the Lord. But as you confess, you hold on. You say, yet still, I belong to you. You hold me with your, you hold my right hand. The right hand in the Bible is the hand, there are many ways to think about it, the right hand and the right side has to do with strength, it has to do with favor, both of those things and other things as well, but it has to do with strength and favor. And here's this beautiful picture, God holds us. He holds our right hand so that we will not slip and fall, so that we will run the race with endurance. And then we end with verses 25 and following. It's a psalm that started off so badly and it ends so very well. It started off with the wicked and it ends with God. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak. But God, shall we read it together? Let's go back. Let's read it together again. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. We end on a note of victory. Why? Because we end by looking to God and staying in the presence of the Lord. How will we run the race with endurance? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer this morning.